Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education, and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Good morning, or perhaps good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you for joining us for this live webinar. We're going to talk about the importance of hospice professionals maintaining regulatory compliance as a top priority. We will discuss how to maintain compliance while helping improve patient care. You'll learn what surveyors look for and how your technology solution can help you meet those required standards. I'm delighted to be with you today. My name is Laura Barnett. I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing for Access. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Access. We are a leading home healthcare technology provider offering a complete suite of easy to use innovative software solutions, empowering hospice, home care, and home health providers to grow your businesses while you work to make lives better. Today, we'll hear from my friend and colleague, Matt Abbott, a senior product manager at Access. He's a member of our hospice product development team where he's leveraging a decade of industry experience to help create Access's hospice software. Prior to joining Access in June 2018, Matt served as a hospice nurse in a wide variety of roles from inpatient unit and field nurse to director of education and director of clinical operations at hospice organizations across the country. He is passionate about hospice care, having served in the hospice industry for the duration of his nursing career. He is a voting member of the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Association and Healthcare Information and Management System Society. Before we dive into the content, a couple of housekeeping items. Everyone's phones are currently muted. However, if you have questions, we invite you to submit those throughout the webinar. If time permits, Matt is going to answer as many of those as he can at the end of the webinar. And if we don't get to your particular question, we will follow up with you after today's session. Following this webinar, we'll provide everyone with a link to the slides that Matt covers, as well as posting a video recording of this webinar on our website, access.com. Matt, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura, for that introduction. Um, uh, as Laura mentioned, uh, I am a hospice nurse by trade. It's something that's in my blood um, and something I'm very passionate about. Um, and as we know, hospice survey security um, and the increased regulatory scrutiny is something that is um, hitting hospice agencies uh, more and more as the years uh, go by. Um, at Access here, we actually listened to the uh, OIG and NHPCO hosted call uh, last week uh, talking about just that thing, moving away from a culture of gotcha um, from a surveyor perspective to a culture of making sure that um, patients and families get the excellent hospice care that they so richly deserve. So um, really excited to be presenting on this very important topic today. Um, so without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So our learning objectives for the day today um, are to be able to list those top 10 survey deficiencies uh, that CMS puts out every year. Uh, so the year we have is 2018, so we'll be reviewing those today. Um, and then we're going to talk about some strategies uh, to avoid these citations uh, specifically um, so that we can improve the care that you're uh, providing at your agency and avoid those tags. Um, and then we're also going to describe ways that your software partner can help you ensure compliance and protect the revenue that you have uh, earned providing this care for those patients uh, and how technology can really be uh, a partner to help you streamline your operations and ensure compliance. So uh, here is a list of the top 10 deficiencies from CMS. This uh, comes out annually. Uh, so we'll look forward to the 2019 survey deficiencies in January of next year. Um, so the top 10 deficiencies are listed here. Uh, and they uh, start with uh, individualizing the plan of care. And so as you probably guessed, we're going to be talking a lot about care planning today. Uh, medication management came in second, and so we'll talk about some strategies, how to manage medication lists for your patients, uh, and how you can make the review of the patient's medication list very evident in your documentation to avoid that citation. Uh, we'll talk about aid supervision, terminal illness management, which is really the name of the game of what we're doing in hospice uh, from, in the, from the get-go, is managing those terminal illnesses to prevent those periods of crisis for our patients. Uh, we'll discuss scope and frequency of services and how we can track that, and again, how your technology vendor uh, can be a, a solution for you to make sure that you're not receiving tags for that, um, 
frequently tagged item. Um, infection control documentation, volunteer management, bereavement assessment and plans of care, comprehensive assessment timing, and IDG collaboration. Uh, so we will review in detail uh, five of these uh, survey deficiencies, um, and please look for a follow-up webinar to discuss strategies uh, to attack the, uh, the other five uh, coming in the near future. The other thing I wanted to share with you all today is the frequency at which these uh, tags are being given. So um, to hear a top 10 list of survey deficiencies uh, may strike fear in your hearts, but um, again, as we have continually advocated um, as an industry, um, there is a very low percentage of providers um, that are receiving tags, and many of us as hospice practitioners are providing care as CMS mandates um, in the conditions of participation. Um, and so you'll see here uh, are the top 10 tags uh, listed. And you can see um, this is a CASPER report that was put out again by CMS uh, based on 794 surveys that were conducted. And even the most frequently served or uh, cited citation, um, that L tag for an individualized plan of care was only tagged on 3.4% of those uh, providers that were surveyed in that survey sample. So again, uh, a large volume of us as hospice practitioners are um, providing care as it is it as it is required by CMS. Um, however, uh, we want to try and get as close to a perfect survey as is possible. Um, again, just because that means we're taking uh, the best care of the patients that have been um, entrusted to our care. Before we get into uh, the specifics of those deficiencies, I want to discuss some survey success strategies. So as you're planning for uh, those inevitable surveys, uh, we want to discuss some strategies for success as you plan for that surveyor to come knocking on your door. So the first thing is to develop and maintain a rapport with your surveyor. Uh, remember, just like when we're talking to physicians, surveyors are people and they have personalities just like we do. And so uh, being able to uh, make friendly contact with those surveyor as soon as they walk in the door, maybe offering them a bottle of water um, and making sure that they have an environment in which they can get their work done, hopefully quickly, so they can walk back out the door um, having not tagged your agency um, at all. Um, another thing would be to establish one point of contact so that the surveyor doesn't walk around the halls of your agency looking for somebody to talk to. Um, and again, you can build on that rapport that you've established when they walked in. Certainly, uh, surviving a survey takes a team of people working together, um, but having one point of contact for that surveyor um, will help that communication surveyor be consistent and timely. When you're answering questions, be mindful that you need only answer what is asked directly of you. Um, you don't need to share additional information that may not be asked by the surveyor. Um, but uh, you do want to be sure that you answer the questions that you're being asked. In addition, uh, we've talked already a little bit, but your software partner can really um, be an asset as you go through the survey process and as you prepare for being surveyed. First, by providing an easy and compliant workflow. So I think we can all uh, tell war stories of our times in hospice um, where uh, documentation is the bane of our existence and it can mean the difference between getting a tag and not getting a tag. So making sure that you have a, an easy and compliant workflow um, and a simple way for your staff to document uh, about the care that they're providing will lead to survey success. Your, your software vendor should also allow you quick and easy access to the documentation that is being requested. Documentation that can't be found or isn't easily accessed cannot be provided to the surveyor uh, and will not protect you um, from, their, uh, from their inquiries. So uh, making sure that you have quick and easy access to that documentation, uh, as well as to various lists and reports that you may need um, to provide to the surveyor as well. The last two items are also very important. Uh, one is keeping up to date with new industry regulations um, and knowing what's going on in the industry is very important to help you uh, be agile and shift uh, 
um, as you need to from a policy and procedure standpoint. Um, and your technology vendor can actually help with that as well. At Access, we certainly pride ourselves on being thought leaders in the industry um, and making sure that uh, new changes in industry regulations are reflected in our software, um, but also doing webinars and events such as the one that you're attending today um, is a great way to keep up to speed with what's going on in the industry um, so that you can be ahead of the curve and ahead of the surveyor before they even walk in the door. And finally, and possibly most importantly, uh, is the need to educate your staff and educate your team, not only on what the industry regulations are and what CMS or state auditors are going to be requiring, but also educating them on the survey process. Um, it is not uncommon for surveyors to go out and do uh, visits with your staff in the field, um, but also sharing with them the outcomes of those surveys. Um, your staff can be better prepared, um, and that will make sure that that survey process goes smoothly um, uh, on your behalf, on the administrative side, um, but also gives them the confidence uh, that they need to practice excellent care. So diving right in here, we're gonna to start to take a look at a few of these individual tags, um, and then we'll talk about the tag and what specifically is requested from CMS, and we will discuss some strategies for success for each of those tags to prevent those from being tagged in the future. Um, so the first one has to do with an individualized plan of care, and any of you that have been in hospice as long as I have, um, this is no stranger to uh, to the frequently tagged list, um, individualizing our plan of care um, is at the heart of what we do as hospice practitioners. Um, Patient-centered and family-centered care is why we get up in the morning to go take care of patients, but making sure that our plan of care reflects the individuality of the patients that we're seeing is super important. So Medicare specifically says that all hospice care and services furnished to the patients and their families must follow this individualized written plan of care, which is established by the hospice interdisciplinary group in collaboration with the attending physician, if any, the patient or representative, and the primary caregiver accordance with the patient's needs, if any of them so desire. Um, and so again, it's making sure that we are inclusive in our assessment, inclusive in our discussion of the patient's plan of care, um, to make sure that those patients' needs are easily identified um, and addressed in writing um, so that uh, every member of the team can provide the care that the patient is requesting. So some strategies for success here uh, would be to develop that plan of care uh, as part of your comprehensive assessment. Um, again, working with uh, a software vendor that will allow you to develop the plan of care as you're going out and doing those assessments is gonna prevent your clinicians from completing an entire assessment and then having to do the care plan as a separate uh, part of their workflow. Um, integrating this allows them to identify those problems in real time uh, and make sure that all of those individualized needs are there on the plan of care as they're going about assessing the patient and talking to the patient and their family. Of course, we need to customize our problem goals and interventions to the patient's needs. So having a cookie cutter care plan uh, where you pick the same problems, the same goals, and the same interventions for any patient, even if you have them for every patient, is also going to lead to a surveyor giving you a tag for not individualizing your plan of care. So having the ability to customize those statements uh, and make sure that they are patient specific and individualized uh, is gonna be key to avoiding a tag in this area. And finally, it's also important that you make sure that your goals are measurable um, and that each individual intervention is assigned to individual members of the interdisciplinary group. And don't forget, you also need to include the patient, a primary caregiver or facility staff for those facility-based patients in your plan of care. Uh, so uh, CMS does want you to show uh, not only uh, what the problems are and what your goals are, but uh, specifically who is providing the services uh, to prevent uh, those problems from recurring for the patient. A couple of additional strategies allow, uh, are to allow documentation of your collaboration uh, in every single note and make sure that as you're uh, reviewing those notes and auditing those notes that you have a place that shows where the plan of care has been reviewed with the patient, the caregiver, facility staff, and members of the interdisciplinary group. We also need to document the care plan uh, teaching and the understanding of 
the teaching that is done on the plan of care um, in every node. So making sure that that documentation is done and that it is easy for your staff to, to go through and do that. Moving on to our next tag, we're going to talk about medication management. Uh, medications are often the key for uh, how we get our patients' symptoms under control. Uh, sometimes we wish we could prescribe medications for family members as well. Unfortunately, we don't have the leeway to do that, but making sure um, that your patient's medications are managed um, so that uh, you and the physician um, and the patient uh, or their caregiver is aware of what medications uh, they are uh, prescribed to help address those problems and concerns um, is uh, very important as well. Um, so again, Medicare specifically says we need to do a review of all of the patient's prescription and over-the-counter drugs uh, and herbal remedies and other alternative treatments that could affect drug therapy. Um, so we'll take a quick pause there to remind you, of course, you need to make sure that that medication list is comprehensive um, and includes all of those over-the-counter medications and herbal remedies. Um, certainly, I can tell you stories, and I'm sure many of you have those as well, uh, of having an entire dining room table at a patient's house covered uh, with medication bottles and medication reviews taking multiple hours um, to go through to make sure that we have a good understanding of what our patients are taking to make sure that they're safe. Um, and then CMS goes on to say this includes but is not limiting, limited to identification of effectiveness of drug therapy, drug side effects, actual or potential drug interactions, duplicate drug therapy, and drug therapy that's currently associated with laboratory monitoring. So making sure for our cardiac patients, um, if they're on those blood thinners, do we need to continue with PTI and R monitoring for our diabetic patients? How often do we need to continue uh, checking their blood glucose levels um, before administering any of those diabetic medications? So making sure that you're able to go through and really do a comprehensive review of the patient's medication list very frequently. So some strategies for success for this particular tag uh, would be to go ahead and check those drug-drug interactions uh, on a frequent basis. Um, so making sure that every time you're making adjustments to the patient's medication list, uh, that we're checking uh, against the other active medications on the list for any interactions that this new or changed medication might have. <clears throat> Also, making sure that you have a physician's order generated for every single medication that is active on your patient's medication list uh, is going to help you ensure compliance. Um, and at Access, we do that automatically, so we want to prevent those transcription errors. And by capturing that physician order in real time as you're manipulating the patient's medication list is going to ensure that you do that good medication review um, as you're adjusting the patient's medication list. Um, many of the nurses that work for me, and I am guilty of complaining about this as well, um, complain about how long it takes to do a medication review, how long it takes to make sure that you have um, a med list from the pharmacy and a med list in the software and a med list in the patient's home and going through and reconciling those medications and reviewing them with the doctor and, and calling back and forth between the pharmacy. Um, so being able to use technology as a partner and as a solution, um, you can drive down the time that it takes. Um, and having that done each time the medication list is adjusted is also going to reduce the amount of time your clinicians are going to have to spend doing a task they don't really like to do. Some additional strategies here are to make sure that all of that review that we've talked about doing at every visit is so easy for surveyors to identify in your clinical record. So making sure that that's done at every visit and that any issues that have been identified with the medication uh, review are documented in the system and can be added to the patient's comprehensive plan of care so that as surveyors are reviewing the documentation that you're providing to them, they can clearly see that you're maintaining compliance with the regulations uh, to frequently review the patient's medication profile. Uh, and finally, making sure that that is done at each visit as well. 
The next tag we're going to talk about here is going to be that of terminal illness management. Um, so this is the L tag 545, um, and Medicare uh, requires that the hospice must develop an individualized and written plan of care for each patient. Where have we heard that before? Um, and that the plan of care must reflect patient and family goals and interventions based on the problems that are identified in the initial comprehensive and updated comprehensive assessments. The plan of care must also include all services necessary for the palliation and management of the terminal illness and its related conditions. Um, so we know uh, that the terminal illness and related conditions is something that we are adjusting to over the past few years. And it's getting harder and harder to show um, items which are not related to the patient's terminal illness or those related conditions. Um, so making sure that that plan of care is comprehensive, again, is going to be important. Making sure that you can document for each comorbidity uh, whether or not that diagnosis is related to the patient's terminal illness uh, is going to uh, allow you to make sure that uh, all of those things are addressed in the patient's plan of care. Um, and we know, uh, based on the final rule that's coming down for 2020, um, that we're going to have to uh, increase uh, the amount that we are doing um, to provide that information to our patients and our caregivers. Um, so again, that's important uh, to have in our clinical record uh, to make sure that that diagnosis relatedness documentation is there for the surveyor, um, but then you'll be able to use that documentation, um, print that out, and provide that as patient and family and caregiver education as well um, as we move into uh, an ever-changing regulatory environment in 2020. You also want to monitor your patient's progress towards goals. So um, the, the heart of this tag in the state operating manual guides us to make sure that we're monitoring the patient's progress towards goals. <clears throat> so uh, not only is it important that we identify what those goals are and involve the patient and family uh, in uh, the development of the plan of care, but we need to every 15 days, be able uh, to monitor that patient's progress towards those goals and make sure that we're doing what we promised to do, which is to take care of that patient and address the needs that they have identified that are important to them. And finally, again, another reminder to customize that plan of care based on your assessment findings. Um, and making sure, uh, again, we remember from that tag, uh, we have to update that plan of care as often as it is necessary um, to uh, identify those changing assessments. We know our hospice patients uh, may today have one set of needs, and that uh, set of needs may change um, overnight or even that same day um, as they go throughout the dying process. So let's take pain, for example. Uh, when you go out and you assess a patient for pain, uh, there are many components to that from a physiologic perspective, uh, but patients can also often suffer from uh, spiritual, psychosocial, or emotional pain as well. And so it's important that each member of the interdisciplinary group is addressing uh, those pain symptoms. So I'll tell you a brief story to illustrate this and the importance of collaborating as an interdisciplinary group. And it involves a patient that I had very early on um, in, in a hospice. Uh, we were taking care of a, a gentleman named Ray, uh, who was a cancer patient. Um, and of course, uh, he had uh, metastases to his bone and to his brain. And so Ray was experiencing a, a pretty significant amount of pain. And each nursing visit, he would report uh, his pain was eight out of 10. Um, and despite all of the medication interventions that we were working on um, as a team, we couldn't seem to get his pain score below an eight. And so our social worker mentioned during our IDG meeting, uh, she said, well, have you ever asked Ray what it is that he wants? And uh, of course the nurse chimed up and said, no, Ray is uh, having eight out of 10 in pain and we need to get his pain under control. That's of course what he wants. And so with the following nursing visit, Ray was asked what he wants, and he said, I really want to be able to walk my grandson to the bus stop in the morning. And so we were able to make that happen for Ray. And on our way back to the house from dropping his grandson off that very first day, he reported 
his pain was a four. We cut his pain in half. And so making sure that we address those emotional and psychosocial needs of our patient um, is super important. And making sure that we track that intervention, walking the grandson to the bus stop, uh, as an intervention that members of the interdisciplinary group can carry out as part of his plan of care. Of course, having that care plan um, available on every visit for every discipline is going to be super important as well. Um, if we spend all of our time writing these things down uh, into our written plan of care that's comprehensive for the patient, but we never have an opportunity to reference that at our visit, uh, it's not going to be a very good roadmap to successful care for taking care of our patients. Um, and so making sure that that care plan can be reviewed at each visit um, and updated as is necessary. Again, we often find out little pieces of information um, at each visit that is made for the patient. Clearly documenting that coordination of care that we do is so important as well. Uh, so I've said for a long time that documentation really, uh, as much of a pain as it is for us uh, to complete as clinicians, uh, that is where we get to take credit for all the work that we do. Um, so all of the lunches that we skip because we're coordinating care, uh, getting equipment delivered, getting medications delivered to a patient who's going to be admitted that afternoon, calling and talking to the social worker, updating the aid on specific things that are needed um, for the hospice aid plan of care, um, all of that care coordination that we do every day, uh, making sure that you're able to document that um, in your documentation system and making that very clearly visible um, to your surveyors is going to help you prevent a tag um, in this uh, team collaboration area. And again, we've mentioned so much that IDG meeting process. This is something that's a very special part um, of hospice care. And so um, that is the most obvious place that we uh, collaborate as a team. But again, making sure that we're documenting the discussion and the collaboration that we're doing at these meetings um, as part of that meeting process um, is going to make sure that when the surveyor comes in, it is very clearly evident all of the hard work that we are doing together as a team to make sure that our patients and their loved ones are taken care of. So uh, we can talk about that a little bit further here um, because we also know that surveyors are looking for uh, all members of the team for the core IDG members um, to be a part of that documentation uh, for the IDG meetings. So again, utilizing technology um, to help make sure that you don't have an out of compliance IDG meeting um, where your software is checking to make sure that all core members have signed into your meeting um, will ensure that when you hand over those meeting sign-in sheets, the meeting agendas um, as part of your survey, um, that you're not going to have an out of compliance IDG meeting uh, because your software has guaranteed that for you. And also, we know that we have to update that plan of care frequently. We've talked about that uh, for several of these tags so far this afternoon. And so making sure that your software can read and make sure that you're meeting that 15-day requirement uh, will just help give you ease of mind when that surveyor walks in to know that your processes are compliant with CMS regulations um, so that you don't have to worry when the surveyor comes knocking at your door. The last tag we're going to talk about in detail today is going to be the scope and frequency of services. So uh, again, specifically Medicare says that a detailed statement of the scope and frequency of services is necessary to meet specific and uh, patient and family needs. So again, um, I, I know probably many of you have had this discussion with your surveyors as they've they've been looking through your record. Um, they're counting up visits to make sure um, that your ordered frequencies from the physicians are, uh, excuse me, in compliance with uh, the visits that have actually been made for your patients. Um, so it's very important that you are able to document uh, the visit frequency in a, in a seamless and easy way and uh, that your uh, documentation system allows 
uh, easy monitoring and tracking of uh, those visit frequencies as well. And so um, that uh, part of compliance uh, is demonstrated um, here on this dashboard screen that we're showing you. Um, and you'll see the frequency watch uh, is there because we need to maintain uh, that visit frequency and not go either above nor below the visit frequency. Um, and so certainly being able to track and get reports on uh, those frequencies um, is important. Um, but even more important is as you're doing your scheduling, uh, getting those ordered frequencies right from the scheduling process. So making sure that you're not able to schedule a visit that's going to be out of compliance uh, with your ordered frequency um, and alerting your staff uh, to those potential um, discrepancies between what has been ordered from the physician and uh, what is being provided. And then, of course, making sure that you review those frequencies on a frequent basis as well to make sure that they still match up with what the patient um, is going to need. So your, um, your hospice aid frequency um, or your nursing frequency, um, making sure that, that uh, as your patient's needs are changing, you're uh, adjusting those to the patient's needs. Um, this is also a consideration uh, now that we have the service intensity add-on payments uh, that are available for uh, patients in the last seven days of life. Um, we know that as a patient's going through the dying process, they're going to be needing additional services um, from, the, from the nurse and from the social worker so that we can address uh, their needs holistically. So, uh, making sure that you uh, are reviewing that as a patient is getting closer and closer and begins that uh, decline and active dying process um, will help you maintain compliance uh, with this as well. Um, and that's also going to impact the cash flow at your agency. So as I mentioned before, uh, it's also very, very important to make sure that your uh, team uh, has an opportunity to be educated uh, about the things that CMS is uh, requiring or that your state agencies or your accrediting bodies are requiring. Um, so making sure that you have a strategy um, to get those regulatory updates so that those can be provided uh, to your staff. Certainly uh, your technology partner uh, can be a key uh, element of that, uh, making sure that those updates are there in the documentation system. Uh, as well as making sure um, that uh, you have access to that inside of the, the software documentation as well. Um, and then certainly encouraging participation of your staff in webinars um, and seminars as they become available or even, or even going to events. They have an opportunity to interact uh, with other members of the hospice community. They get a keep their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the industry, um, but also this fosters learning uh, from uh, outside uh, your agency to make sure that, that uh, your agency stays on the cutting edge of what's going on um, inside the industry. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned before, having those transparent conversations after a surveyor uh, has left and uh, then you can make sure that any issues that might have been identified um, are clearly shared with your staff and they can help you as you strategize um, for uh, upcoming or following surveys um, that you may have. Uh, and again, just remember technology is absolutely um, a, a solution and a partner for you. Um, because all of the time that you save uh, documenting um, in a compliant and a simple way um, is really going to build in the time that your staff is going to need uh, to get that important education um, about the survey process. So the first question here is uh, a request really to share the slide deck. Um, so, uh, again, we will be sending out copies of the slide deck uh, to the participants of this webinar. Um, so you will have an, uh, access to those and then you can utilize those inside your agency um, uh, or as you see fit in the future. There uh, is a question here, uh, is it okay to set goals on a monthly basis instead of every 14 days? 
Um, and so the answer to your question is yes. Um, again, the goal setting process is uh, that you need to make sure um, that they're patient specific. So um, as you're going through uh, and talking to patients and their families, um, identifying the problems and then establishing a realistic timeline for you to establish that goal. The important thing to remember if you're going to establish that is as part of your IDG review process, you wanna measure the patient's progress towards that goal um, as the month progresses. So if you set that, you know, for example, their pain score is gonna reduce from seven to five um, in a month, um, hopefully that would be a little quicker, but if that's your goal, um, then you wanna measure at each visit um, and uh, make sure that that is evident in your record that you're addressing the patient's pain at each visit um, and how you're progressing towards meeting that goal timeline. Um, so great question. Uh, the next question we have here is for medication reconciliation, is a part of the process to have a support staff person enter the medications or the nurse enter the medications on admission? Um, so, uh, Another great question, and thank you for thank you for the question. Um, there are various ways to tackle making sure that you're getting medications on the medication list. Um, certainly, uh, it is probably best practice to have um, your nurse participate in gathering that accurate medication list. Um, but certainly you want to do that in concert with somebody that has medication training. Uh, many hospice agencies uh, are contracted with a pharmacy provider, um, and so uh, they have integrations uh, where you can submit a medication list and then it's uh, dumped into the software. Um, so there's many ways uh, to do that. The important part uh, for the TAG purposes is to make sure um, that the medication review is done on a frequent basis. Um, so I would certainly recommend, again, doing that as part of each of your nursing visits to make sure that there's no changes um, to the patient's medication list. Um, and that can be especially tricky for your nursing home patients as well. Sometimes that um, attending physician that rounds at the nursing home um, may make changes on the chart. So it's important, especially too, as you're looking through um, your nursing home records um, to do that at every visit and make sure that there's no changes that have been um, added there as well. Thank you, Matt, for sharing your wisdom and expertise to help us all prepare for and maintain compliance within our hospice organizations. As Matt said, we'll make a um, link to the slides and um, a video recording available to you as soon as possible. Thank you for joining us today as we continue to deliver on our mission to empower healthcare organizations and professionals with the world's best technology solutions. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home health care technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access. Empowering care anytime, anywhere.